Today is July the 9th, 2021. My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. And with me today is Catherine Mills Wilson, the daughter of the, of the late Denver Mills. And this interview is being recorded with Zoom and will be part of the We Will Remember Promise Oral History Project. So thank you for being with us today. And by way of context, January 27, 2001, a plane crashed carrying 10 men associated with the Oklahoma State University men's basketball program, and Catherine's father was among those lost. In the aftermath, the university and the cowboy community made a promise to always remember these 10 men. So before we, we talk about that day and what happened afterwards, let's begin with learning a little bit about you. Start wherever you like. Hey, thank you so much. This is such a pleasure to be a part of it. And it's amazing after so many years uh, to continue to take the time to remember those uh, great men, really great men on the on that plane. So it's a treat to talk about uh, my dad today. And as far as I go, I'm 50 years old. So I was born in Oklahoma City. Uh, my mom and dad had been married about three years when I was born. And uh, we I grew up and went to public school, Putnam City Schools, and then I went to Oklahoma Baptist University and loved that. So I, and then I went to, uh, well, I got married right after college and lived in Dallas for a little bit and Austin for a little bit, working in uh, nonprofits and in uh, some public policy groups. And then uh, my husband at the time uh, got a job in Washington, D.C., so we moved out to D.C. and we were living there uh, when my dad's, when the, when the plane crashed, but we lived in DC for about 12 years total and absolutely loved it. I worked uh, primarily for Bob and Elizabeth Dole um, in various capacities, starting on the 1996 Dole for President campaign. And I was an aide to Elizabeth Dole during that time, which was fabulous and so much fun. And they're just fantastic uh, people. And uh, then uh, she, after the presidential campaign, she went back to being president of the American Red Cross National Headquarters. And I got to go back and uh, be on her team in various capacities uh, at the Red Cross, which was fantastic. And then she ran for president and I got to work for her on that brief campaign. And then uh, she set up her own office uh, and I helped her with her speeches at the time she was doing a lot of public speaking. And we worked with a, ver a whole variety of nonprofits uh, from the startup phase to getting uh, people off the ground to, uh, you know, actually just helping with uh, fundraising or organizational processes and things like that. But then I had my um, kiddos. So I didn't work. It was such a busy schedule. I couldn't do that and take care of babies. So um but I was working for Elizabeth Dole at the time of the, the plane crash and uh, Bob and Elizabeth were so kind, uh, you know, over the top to be uh, supportive of me and, and my family. Okay, well, let's back up and put some dates in with this. When did you graduate from high school? Oh, I graduated from Putnam City North in 1988. 88. And at that point, what was your plans? What were, your, what were you thinking you would want to do as your career? Oh, good question. I absolutely <laughs> thought I knew for sure that I wanted to be a CPA just like my dad. Okay. Yeah, he was at the time he was the partner in a downtown, uh, one of the big CPA firms. And uh, I would go with him sometimes Sunday afternoons to help him do his catch up work. And I found it to be fascinating, but I definitely thought that's what I wanted to do. And uh, when I went to college and I started in the accounting program, I just I became more interested in uh, business education, teaching accounting, teaching business schools. So that's what I majored in was business education with an emphasis in accounting. And uh, I really, uh, I did do student teaching while I was in college, uh, but I've never officially taught uh, since student, student teaching. I went straight into PR and marketing and then politics. So. <laughs> 
I don't know if, I don't think my dad was ever disappointed. He just, uh, you know, but my brother who is eight years younger than me and was a student at OSU uh, at the time of the plane crash, he did major in accounting and that is what he's still doing today. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He's doing accounting work. So my dad left a pretty strong uh, mark on us, on me for sure, that uh, I, you know, he loved his clients and his clients uh, loved him. So I hear all the time now that I'm back in Oklahoma City uh, and I'm in the accounting world now, uh, I started my own business about a year and a half ago. That's um, it's outsourced bookkeeping and controller services. And I work with a lot of CPAs and I can't even I mean, it's still to this day. I meet somebody at least once a week who knew my dad and worked with him. And they they tell all these stories about how he used to bring donuts to the office whenever he stopped by, or he took the time to remember the names of the assistants or the, you know, the front desk receptionist. And those are the people who really remember him uh, because nobody else was kind enough, you know, or, or had thought about saying hi to them or asking them about their kids or telling them a joke or something like that. I just, um, constantly hear people who who knew my dad or worked with him in some way or capacity. So it's such a joy. My family and I, we talk about it all the time, how uh, we're so thankful that my dad left such a positive uh, memory for so many people. Sounds like he was a very much a people person. A yeah. People, a people person. Not always the way CPAs are. So I <laughs> think reason he stood out (laughs) but yes he was he loved people he was known for uh you know if somebody needed anything money he needed help fixing something or needed a connection that's that's what gave him a ton of joy was uh you know being able to solve somebody's problem well in in high school was math your favorite subject yeah if you were going to go into cpa okay Math and I and in this at Pendham City North at the time there were also accounting classes so I had taken some accounting classes in high school and I really en- enjoyed that too. And so are there just the two of you, your brother and yourself, or do, do, is there another sibling? We have another sibling. I have a sister who's two years younger than me. So all three of us went to Pendham City North High School, and so my sister graduated in. Um, 1990. <laughs> I had to think about that for a second. And my brother graduated in 1997. Okay. Is, is she into to math too? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> She's not into math at all. She went into, she's actually, she is a business executive and she okay. works in the business world and she's a people pleaser too. We're all, we're all kind of people pleasers for sure. And uh, people love to tell me, well, that's like what your dad would have done. And we're like, good, then we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, you know, but he, uh, she is a, an executive at farmer's insurance at the, at the, uh, like a corporate office that they have. Okay. So he would be pleased with all three of you then. Yes, definitely. And we hated that. Uh, so we, none of us had had our kids before the plane crash, but now we have between us seven, uh, is that right? Yeah, seven kids. <laughs> so mine is that my two are the oldest. I have a 19 year old Denver that I named after my dad. And he was born um, in uh, June of 2002. So about, you know, that was one of the things that changed my life for sure is, you know, I was in DC working, busy, having a great time. <laughs> and my ex husband was bi- really busy building his career and we hadn't really thought about having a family. I mean, we thought about it, but it seemed like something we were going to do some at some point. And then after my dad died, um, we, it just became so crystal clear that that we wanted to build a family as soon as possible because, uh, you know, we were so struck by, um, you know, the family that my dad's family, my mom's family, everybody coming together um, and the support that it was during a difficult time and uh we just kind of kicked ourselves thinking, why haven't we done this yet? I don't know. We just lost track of what was priority and important. So we started right, you know, right as soon as we could to start uh, building our family. And I got pregnant pretty quick. And we knew right away that if it was a boy, we were going to name him Denver. And sure mm-hmm. enough, it was. So it's such a trace. So my son's name is Denver Mills Wilson. Okay. And so he's got my dad's uh, 
full name and people tell him all the time, you know, he's got big shoes to fill <laughs> and uh, he, he doesn't mind. <laughs> he doesn't he's fine with that. And they have a second one, a second son. I have another son, Carson, and he's 17. He's getting ready to be a senior in high school now. And uh, Carson's fantastic. He actually looks like my dad. Um, and that's kind of fun. So we, we have the two of us. And then my sister has three children. Uh, she has twins, a boy and a girl twins who are now two and a five-year-old. So she, oh, she got her hands full then. <laughs> Definitely has her hands full. And then my brother has a son who's 14. And then he has also a, a baby. He's got a little girl who's two. So it's fun. <laughs> They're really spread out. Any of them interested in being pilot? Yes. Actually, my son Carson is taking his private pilot's license now. So he's he's about ready to graduate to phase four which I think there's only five phases. So he's making some good progress and he's really enjoying it. Well, that keeps him busy too. <laughs> it does. It keeps him busy. I think he's, uh, yeah, he, at first I don't know that he knew that's what he's, he's very interested in science and math. And uh, he's, you know, we're starting college, thinking about college applications. And one of the things that his counselors were encouraging him is to pick, find something unique about, him, you know, that he can say that separates him from all the other kids who have great grades in science and math. And so he, we discussed possibly, you know, if he got his private pilot's license now, uh, that would be a unique, especially since he's wanting to apply for aerospace uh, engineering. So, yeah. so he's doing that and has, hopefully everything works like it's supposed to, but you know, it's uh, people ask me sometimes, well, do you, are you afraid of your son flying an airplane or would you even get on another airplane again? And I'm like, absolutely. Yes, I will do it. I mean, it doesn't scare me at all, really. I mean, I at all might be an excess, but not more than getting in a car would or anything else. He, I think my dad um, definitely instilled in us to, you know, a love for airplanes and a love for that type of flying. And, you know, my first I, under, I don't remember this, but my mom and dad tell, told me that uh, I flew with my dad at three weeks old, uh, that we went up on a weekend. And one of my favorite pictures uh, that I wanted to find immediately after my dad passed away is a picture of me standing on the wing of an airplane that he, my dad had owned at the time. And I was about three. So mm -hmm. I going to the airport with my dad was definitely important to me and something that I loved doing with him. And so I don't have any kind of a, a fear of getting on another King Air or, a, you know, a, a smaller plane, either one. Well, as uh, growing up like that, did you do parachuting or was that I've never, not not part of it? Okay. I've never done, but it is on my bucket list to do maybe like a tandem jump, but some okay. <laughs> I wondered. So you would go up with him well quite often? Yeah, I would say a lot. And you know, at least once or twice a month. Um, oh. so he would go fly. He sometimes you know, he had a bunch of different reasons for flying. Um but he would always fly us on family vacations. You know, we went to Colorado a few times and we would go see my dad grew up in uh, Eastern Kentucky. And so it was common that we would, a couple times a year, we would load up in a plane and fly to Eastern Kentucky to go see his family. And that was always, you know, great, uh, a great memory pulling, you know, flying into, I think it was called London airport, or there was a airport in Pineville or Barberville or something like that. But the, all of my dad's siblings and their kids would be there at the airport waiting on us to come. And that, that was a good, that's a really happy memory, I think doing that. But yeah, no, I flew with dad all the time. And uh, even within about a month after the plane crash for work purposes, I had to get on a King Air uh, for work. And I, I thought, well, here we go. You know, I just, you know, you can't uh, live life in, in fear like that. And actually I felt like kind of at the time I was feeling like it really honored my dad uh, to, you know, just keep going, not let something like that uh, scare you. Well, then let's back up a little bit before we get too far off. When it like prom time, did he 
how was he with you dating? <laughs> That's a good question. You know, he, I, I do have memories of, especially as even going back before high school, junior high, you know, those really awkward years in junior high when you're trying to, when you don't feel pretty and you don't feel like, you know, you're doing things right and friends sh- or ships come and go and they're odd and uh, all of that. And my dad, especially being a guy, you know, he was very sensitive to um, me and my sister and wanting us to feel beautiful and feel like he loved us very much, no matter what we looked like. And he would tell us all the time, uh, you're so beautiful. You know, your heart is gorgeous. You know, you, you're doing the right thing, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. And one of the things that uh, he would do for both me and my sister is he uh, maybe once a month, uh, he would take us by ourselves uh, shopping or whatever we wanted to do. So usually mine was going to the mall. That's what I <laughs> My sister liked going to the batting cages. She was more of an athlete. So he would take her to the batting cages and let her, you know, and just pitch balls at her for a couple hours. And she loved doing that with him. Um, and sometimes she would go to the mall, but that wasn't what she wanted to do. I, but it's almost always what I wanted to do. And my dad would usually buy one thing, you know, like we would, you know, but he'd sit outside of the dressing room and wait. Well, I tried on everything, you know, that I wanted to try on. And then we'd pick one thing, you know, and uh, I look back on that as an adult and having kids. And it really means more even now than it did then, because, you know, it's, he, I know he was busy and he had lots of stuff he needed to do, but he's taking, you know, he's doing, he's finding the way to be what we needed, you know, at the time. And, and he, we always felt like he loved doing that. <laughs> you know, he put on a good show, I guess, making me think that's exactly where he wanted to be is sitting outside of the dressing room. <laughs> I tried on, you know, as a 14, 15 year old, uh, awkward adolescent. So that's one of my fun things that I like to share about my dad and people <laughs> just like, I'm pretty sure that wasn't where he wanted to be. <laughs> he wanted to be with me, you know, which was fantastic. And then I'd say dating. Um, yes, he was definitely the kind of guy who would wait up and stand at the door when I came home from a date. And uh, I remember getting upset with him a couple of times. I was like, Dad, you know, don't stand there because I won't get a good night kiss. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, I think I'm going to keep standing here. <laughs> He definitely was not, uh, he, he felt like, you know, he was very, he was very protective of uh, making sure that I wasn't in a position that, uh, you know, I let go of my heart too soon. Okay. And, and did he teach you how to drive? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and my mom did not do that for any of us. My dad did that for all of us. And it's interesting because it's what, like, I think all three of us, well, for me, and then my brother's doing it for his son. I mean, I did it for my boys, as opposed to my husband at the time. <laughs> you know, I don't know if my dad just his patience level just is instilled in us. But yeah, he did teach me how to drive and uh, taught me how to drive a, a standard and an automatic and taught me how to change tire and check my oil, uh, all the things that you used to have to do you know, about 30 years ago that you don't necessarily, now the computer at the car tells you if the oil needs attention. But back then we had to know how to look and see how it was doing. And he bought my, you know, went with me to pick out and buy a first car and all of that. So he was definitely the, um, you know, the in charge of those kinds of things in our lives. Well, being at a CPA, did he teach you about money management early? like an own bank account or savings or whatever. We did. We had a bank account early on and we all got paid for um, chores that we did. It wasn't very much. <laughs> you know, I remember that thinking, I don't think I'm going to be able to go shopping with this little amount of money, but I did, we did do that. And then we, uh, I do remember being in college and uh, all of my mail still came to my parents' house and I had gotten my first uh, credit card. And I was pretty excited about having a credit card and I had gone shopping <laughs> with it. I didn't tell my parents I went shopping. I mean, I was kind of like, I knew I would pay it off. I mean, I had my own job in, in college and I made okay money, you know, so I, I had enough to pay for it. I just, 
had I had the first time the payment had come in, I didn't pay it off in full. I paid like half of it thinking I would pay the other half on the next pay period. Well, my dad opened up my mail and saw that I had not paid off my credit card in full. And he immediately called me. <laughs> I was at my summer job and I was probably 20 years old at the time. And he says, you know, I'm looking here at your credit card statement and I see that you didn't pay it off. And he said, it's really important that you know to never spend any money unless you have the money to pay it off. And I said, well, I do actually have the money to pay it off. I just kind of elected to let it go. And he says, that's a horrible idea. You know, he was very upset about it. And he said, if you ever don't have enough money to pay off your credit card, you let me know and I'm going to pay it off. You should never, ever, ever carry balance because the interest is too high. I mean, you can get bank loan for less than you're going to pay. You're going to pay too much in interest if you let, if you pay, if you let your credit card balance go unpaid. And I was like, okay. So, and that's all I needed was one little, I hadn't really thought about it that much other than I kind of wanted to keep the money in my account than send it to the credit card company. And uh, I have kept that promise to him ever since. Always pay off my credit card every month and don't carry a balance. And, uh, you know, he, that was important to him. Do you think he gave the same talk and a lesson to the, your siblings? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and I do think I probably was a little better at say, you know, being the oldest. Yeah, to- sure. So my sister, she was hard for her to save money because she bought things. Mostly it was a lot athletic type equipment, you know, like a new ball glove or a bat or something like that. She did play uh, competitive softball all mm-hmm. growing up. And my dad was a coach on her team and he's uh, he really enjoyed that. Uh, so the, a lot of my sister's friends who grew up on this competitive softball team, uh, stay in touch with me and my sister and talk about my dad a lot. Uh, and, you know, the role he had for them as a coach uh, in his spare time. So it, I mean, just even the whole concept of having spare time didn't seem odd to us at the time. But now as grownups, you're thinking he, really, you know, sacrificed his time quite a bit to, uh, to be around us and to be influential. You know, he and my mom um, volunteered at our church if for our church youth group, um, he would be up that we, they had like a study hall on Tuesday nights in high school and he would always volunteer to be one of the parents up there helping people with their homework. Um, so it was in essence, it was kind of like free tutoring for people who needed help. And, uh, my dad was everybody's favorite tutor, you know, <laughs> cause he knew the answer and he would usually have a funny story to tell as part of that process too. Um, they opened up their home, uh, repeatedly for, um, you know, youth group Bible studies or for overnight weekend retreats. And in fact, on the weekend of the crash, my mom and dad were hosting a group of teenagers at their house. I I forget the name of the uh, weekend, but it was, I think they were seventh and eighth graders. They had 10 of them, uh, boys at their house. And, uh, you know, so that was what my dad was coming home to from (laughs) this trip to Boulder was going to be to take it to disciple and work with uh, some kids for the rest of the weekend. That must have been hard on the whole whole group then to to get that news. It was it was really hard. But my mom has uh, had some great friend. My parents had great friends who uh, were part of it as well, and they were there to manage. You know, they managed it perfectly fine. <laughs> you know, it was uh, it just one of those things you you know obviously aren't expecting. But I do think it was indicative of, um, you know, just kind of the way my parents were uh, and what people's memories are of my dad uh, and my memories of my dad, uh, just constantly giving and um, and wanting to make a positive difference in other people's lives. Well, if he was born in Kentucky, how did he end up in Oklahoma? <laughs> That's a good story. Well, he was he's middle of five children. And he's the only, he's the first one to kind of get out of working in the coal mines and working in that industry in that area. But he did that by joining the Air Force. And he got out, he joined the Air Force and he was stationed in Okinawa, Japan. 
And that's was his first assignment. And so he was there uh, and that's how he met my mom. Uh, Cause my mom's dad was a, a Lieutenant Colonel in the army. And my mom was 18 or 19 at the time, I think 18. So she was still you know, living with her parents. She's the oldest of six kids. And uh, so they were in Okinawa. So my parents met, at, I think the first Baptist church in Okinawa, Japan in around 1966 something like that. And um, they hit it off, started dating. And um, my mom tells a funny story about my dad coming to pick her up at, uh, at, her, at you know, my mom's house. <laughs> and my grandfather was having a general and there was a general in town or something. And the general was over at my grandparents' house for dinner. And I guess my dad <laughs> accidentally hit the general's car uh, when he was picking up my mom. <laughs> And so they had to go in together to tell this general that, uh, you know, his car had been hit. And, you know, it was my mom, she, she tells the story. She said the general was very polite and nice about it. It wasn't bad, but it was uh, also really obviously highly embarrassing for my dad <laughs> to be in that. <laughs> but they got married. So my, my mom's parents ended up um, settling in Oklahoma City. Okay. Uh, my mom and dad lived in, uh, when they first got married, they lived in Massachusetts and then they lived in Kentucky. And my dad went to Eastern Kentucky University to finish school there because uh, on his Air Force scholarship or the money that he got from serving in the Air Force. So he, um, and so they lived there. And then uh, one of the reasons that my dad thought living in Oklahoma City would be great, well, number one, being close to my mom's parents, which is what she wanted to do. But also he said Oklahoma is perfect for flying because it's flat. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I know. So, <laughs> <laughs> it, it has a lot to do with why we live here is because um, it's flat <laughs> and it's good for flying. Well, how had he gotten interested in flying? Oh, that's a great question. I think it's just because the Air Force was the um, you know, what he thought he wanted of the, he knew he wanted to go into the armed forces in order to have money to pay for college. And cause he didn't, he grew up very, very poor. And um, so he just picked the air force. That was what most interested him and seemed like the a path that was more, you know, what interested him more than the others. So he learned how to fly while he was in the, in the air force. Okay. Although his primary responsibilities were, um, more toward the maintenance of the aircrafts. He was involved in a lot of that type of work as that was his responsibilities as in the Air Force. Uh, I don't think he was a pilot in the Air Force, but he did learn how to fly. And so his interest in being a CPA came, how do you, do you know how he got interested in that? No, I don't know that. No, no. I know he majored in accounting and uh, picked, you know, immediately tested for the CPA and got that in his first job. Uh, was, uh, well, he had a bunch of different jobs, my mom would say in college, you know, like, cause he didn't have any money. So he had to work, uh, you know, constantly for income. Um, but he, when they, they moved to Oklahoma city, when my mom was pregnant with me, uh, because that was the decision point to live here. And he got a job at Deloitte Haskins and sales. And it's a, it's a precursor of what a current big CPA firm, uh, that's called uh, Deloitte and Touche, but I think then since then it's been called something else. But uh, anyway, he was uh, got he had passed his CPA, and that was his first job working in downtown Oklahoma City as a CPA for um, Deloitte Haskins and Sales. <laughs> so he was uh, that's where he started, and then he he did become partner at Deloitte Haskins and Sales, and he was the youngest partner in the history of the Oklahoma City office. So that was neat. I mean, he just uh, worked really hard. Everybody liked him. You know, it was easy for clients. He had a great uh, way with clients of helping them understand their books and uh, you know, different decisions that they needed to make in order to increase their income or to sell their business or whatever types of advice he had good, good thoughts. He also had a, a little bit of a, a twang from growing up in Kentucky and so I think it was endearing to people, uh, always endearing to us too. Uh, he's, he lost it 
quite a bit over the years, but every now and then uh, you could hear it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and just some different terms that uh, he grew up with that we weren't familiar with, um, like calling a, um, a paper sack is called a poke. Uh, so yep. we'd call it that and we would just get the biggest kick out of that. And, uh, but I think his, his, uh, kind of country boy, small town, uh, twang demeanor was, was very endearing. Uh, I don't think he used it in a manipulative way, but it did take the guard, people's guard down, especially when you're talking about something as important and personal as, as money. I guess he gave that lecture about paying off your credit card a few more times with other people. <laughs> yes, in a very simple way, you know, it was never judgy. It was more just like, this is not a good decision for you. But right. I'm thinking about your best interest. Well, do you know how he came to be called Denver? And that's an unusual first name. It is. And people, a lot of times people assume it's after the city, but my dad had a great uncle whose name was Denver and his name was also Denver Mills because they had, you know, it was a Mills side of the family, but he fought, he was, he was a decorated world war II vet and, or, and that's all I know really. But um, so my dad was born in 1945 and it was about the time that uh, this, uncle was uh, recognized for his valor and uh, my dad was the next child born after the recognition and so they, they named him after. Well did he have any leisure activities that he liked to do like golf or fish or anything like that besides flying and taking you to the mall? <laughs> <laughs> Mostly it was flying I would say. Okay. Uh, he did he could play tennis so sometimes we would play tennis um, we take uh, one of our normal types of family trips would be to a, um, like we would go to Shangri-La sometimes, which uh, was up at by Grand Lake and they have a golf course and they have uh, tennis courts and we, um, it would be normal for us to maybe play a couple sets of tennis or something like that. But he, on the, on a regular day in and day out, um, maybe on the weekend, he, he would be at the airport if he was he had some downtime. Okay, then uh, talk a little bit about family traditions like at Christmas or birthdays or the special things that you would do. Oh, yeah. Well, mostly we would have, uh, you know, we have a lot of extended family. So on my mom's side, and primarily they live in Oklahoma City. So she's the oldest of six kids and all of them have kids. And uh, so we typically would get, we gather, you know, for a family meal at somebody's house for to celebrate a birthday. Um, that's what we did primarily. I'm trying to think if there was any special, uh, obviously for my 16th birthday, my dad, uh, he was a member at the Botroyum Club downtown at the time. And in fact, that's where his office was uh, because after he had been a partner at Deloitte Haskins and Sales, he moved firms and he just went on as a partner for another firm downtown called Coopers and My Brand at the time. And now that's called Price Waterhouse Coopers. But he had an office on the 30th floor of the Chase Tower downtown. And right above that, on the 34th floor, was the Petroleum Club. But my dad rented out a big room at the Petroleum Club for my 16th birthday. And uh, we had a big and big party. And that was super fun. Yeah, cool. Kind of the type of party I, I like to have. <laughs> uh, my sister, on the other hand, I think they went to a, they rented out a pool for her 16th birthday party. You know, it just was a different, uh, different meets or different things that we want to do. But it does speak to, again, my dad was always way more concerned about celebrating somebody else uh, rather than anybody celebrating him. So I know when my mom's mother had her 80th birthday, um, all of the guys in the family wore these frilly aprons and dressed, and they did the cooking and the serving of the dinner and all the ladies, you know, were seated and uh, treated like royalty in honor of my grandmother. And that was kind of fun to see my dad in a, you know, for, <laughs> and, <laughs> attempting to put a big meal together and cook. And but he, he could do it. I mean, he really could. Uh, he, he was a great griller. You know, he, he'd make great burgers or chicken or whatever. Uh, he was definitely in charge of the grill if we were grilling anything. And um, he had 
Strong Phillies, his favorite restaurant was Charleston's. Um, and we, he could be seen there a lot. And in fact, I just ate there this week with my mom and my sister. And we were talking about how that's the last uh, place I went to dinner with my dad. And uh, I had come home from DC for Thanksgiving. And uh, on that Saturday night before the Sunday I flew back to DC, we'd gone to that Charleston there on Northwest Expressway, uh, which was very common. <laughs> and I think he ordered the exact same thing every time. He, he loved their baked potato soup and their cheeseburgers. So that's pretty much what he, he would do. That's what I was going to say. What was his favorite food then? Yeah. Yeah. What was one of your favorite presents like at Christmas or, or even a birthday that he would that he gave you that you yeah. still have? Or he, My dad was pretty sweet about um, buying, you know, buying me things that were feminine and special. And uh, I think he would more often than not on a birthday, uh, go get me, buy me something from BC Clark. That was kind of one of his, he'd go to the one downtown and have the associate there pick out, you know, just a pair of small, you know, little earrings or a necklace with a charm on it or something like that. And then sometimes he, he bought like a, you know, a rope necklace. I never went with him and picked it out. He, somebody at BC Clark helped him. I'm sure. But he, you know, how it comes in a, I don't know if you've ever seen a BC club, you know, but it comes in a really pretty package with a big bow and it feels very, it felt very girly and uh, special. So that was um, something he started and I still love to get presents from BC Clark. <laughs> I feel bad for all the people in my life that my dad started that tradition. <laughs> and he, he did. He, I think he would, uh, um, that was a go-to for him. Obviously, you know, he made a big deal about getting a car when I turned 16. And um, those are the things I remember the most. Well, when it came time to go off to college, did he have any advice or input into where you, where you decided to go? Not really. He, we did go to, I mean, he went with me to tour. We went to OSU and we went to OU and um, NOB. You know, those are the only three schools we looked at. And um, my best friend it was a year older than me in high school and she went to OBU. And so I think it was just understood in my family that I was going to go there because I just thought I, I'd been to visit her and it was small and uh, it did seem like I would have an opportunity to do more uh, than just business or whatever. And uh, so I, I, I'd say he didn't really have a, I think he supported it um, for sure, but he didn't have it, you know, he didn't push one school over another. He just, did he have any requirements that it be in state versus out, out of state? No. All that, but I also wasn't really looking for anything out of state. I was really looking to stay. I was, I came home a lot in <laughs> college. <laughs> I would come home on a, you know, on a Friday and go back on Saturday or come home on Saturday and go back on Sunday. I, I liked to be home. And, uh, I think on your, if you had your own car, you probably drove yourself to, to, to move in. To, to yeah. And my dad and mom came with us. And too, okay. They were there for move-in day. And, uh, you know, and he, he come, he stopped and he had a client in Shawnee um, and I, he would be there and he'd call me and say, I'm going to be in Shawnee tomorrow. Do you want to go to lunch or something like that? And I was like, absolutely. <laughs> Always said yes. Uh, that, that does make me think too, something else that came to be uh, when I was in college, starting my freshman year, my dad would always, always send uh, roses on Valentine's day. Um, and that was special, you know, just to, just, he always liked kind of being our, our Valentine. And uh, that was really nice with, <clears throat> always a sweet note attached and a, or a piece of encouragement. And that, was, that was fun. And when I was at OBU, it always hit. Uh, and he continued that really until uh, several years into my marriage. Uh, but I don't know <laughs> what point it stopped. <laughs> but he's been in college. Uh, yes, I got roses on Valentine's Day from my dad. And you would have graduated from college in 1992. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you got married in 93 In 93. Do you have any special memories from that day regarding your dad? On I, your wedding, wedding day? He had a, I mean, I think he was okay with, um, 
me getting married, but he did have a hard time with it. And my mom would say that uh, she probably got the brunt of it because he just really uh, he did feel like, you know, that my husband and I were getting married quickly. And he, he had a feeling that we were going to move away. <clears throat> and he really didn't like that either. <laughs> so he was supportive in pub, you know, in public, but I think it was really difficult for him in private. So, but he, he managed to, he survived. <laughs> he survived. Yeah. And he was, he, but he's very supportive. And even uh, when we moved, we did move away and we were living in Dallas and my dad would have a reason to be in Dallas fairly regularly, once a quarter or something like that. And I would always take the time to go have, um, have, you know, lunch with him or dinner, whatever. So, and he would usually even, so when I used to come home from college, something else my dad did for all of us is he would usually have like a hundred dollar bill and, you know, he'd give us a hundred dollar bill, which was great, <laughs> you know, to go back and use that for a few weeks or something like that for to buy lunch, or save it or whatever. But even uh, when he would visit me out of college, a lot of times he tried to give me money, trying to give me a, and I'd be like, I'm okay. And he still wanted to give money. So <laughs> that's, a, that's a fun memory. And even when I lived in Austin, I remember he had to be in Austin for work a couple of times. And a lot of times he would be flying into the airport. So I'd just go to the airport and we'd have lunch at the cafe or something like that. And so it was always was fantastic to see him when we moved from Texas to um, Washington, D.C., uh, was, there, was, there were a lot of logistics involved with our dogs, and we had two golden retrievers at the time, and my dad offered to, I was, I was trying to just do a lot of different things, <laughs> and it was during the time of the, uh, the Bob Dole for President campaign, so it was during the time of the presidential election, and I was traveling a lot with the campaign, and so my parents had offered to watch the dogs while we're until things settled down. So things settle down, the campaign's over, time to get the dogs and get them out to Washington DC, right? <laughs> and so uh, my dad being my dad, he says, why don't I just fly him? I'm like, okay, why don't you just fly? <laughs> so he, uh, my two little golden retrievers got a very special trip uh, to Washington DC to uh, finally hook can reconnect with uh, with me after the campaign was over. That was that was nice. I wonder if he strapped them in. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I did ask my mom. I said, "What were the, what was on the dog's faces when he took off?" And they, she said they both went. <laughs> <laughs> well, would she would she fly with him very often? Your mother? Yeah, she flew with him a lot. She never did learn how to fly herself, uh, but she she would go with him. A, to a lot of places. I don't think she traveled with him uh, very much when he was doing the OSU uh, travel, but um, you know, yeah, she, she would get in the plane with him. It wasn't her favorite thing to do, um, you know, on the weekends or whatever to go, just to go for a flight, but uh, she did, she did do it quite a bit. And she understood his passion. So. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It was always a funny joke. He would say, um, like she'd call him, you know, she would always have my mom back then. I think it was more common than it is now to have a full dinner every night. So she would cook dinner every night and she, my dad would have a plate and, you know, ex be expected to eat dinner, you know, <laughs> and uh, she would call him and, uh, you know, at 630 or something like that. And he uh, would always be, it was before mobile, mobile phones, mm -hmm. but she could get him usually at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> and he would say, uh, I'm going to be home in two minutes. That's what we joked with him all the time about what, what is two minutes exactly? <laughs> sometimes it was five minutes and sometimes it was 20 minutes, but uh, he would always say two minutes. But so you, you lived pretty close to the airport then? We did. And that was also, I mean, <laughs> by design. So I grew up, uh, my dad always flew out of, mostly I should say, 99% of the time would fly out of Wiley Post Airport which okay. there on the north side, northwest side of town. That's where we lived in that vicinity all growing up. And uh, it's interesting, too, because so my parents, uh, my mom's known as a, a bargain type person. You know, she clipped coupons and she looks for deals and she gets really excited, you know, on Black Friday and things like that. So 
we, we gave her a little bit of a hard time about that, but we joked because back in um, probably 1995 or 96, something like that, um, there was a sale at the cemetery that's close to my parents' house and it was a two for one. So my mom had got wind of that and they, she and my dad had gone out and went ahead and bought their cemetery plots because uh, it was a special two for one, <laughs> you know, and uh, the, the plots are directly underneath the path, the flight path in Dewellable's airport. That's appropriate, I suppose. <laughs> I don't think, I mean, my mom says she didn't catch on to it at the time that my dad might have thought that was a good place to be or something like that. She said he really didn't put much thought into it at all. But, you know, obviously when we go and visit the cemetery plot now, we just can't believe it. You know, how uh, there's just continuous flow of planes, you know, right there where he is. Did they do anything special for or unique for the headstone or the marker? It does have an airplane on it. And I thought it might. (laughs) And it's got a, a unique uh, tail number, and it says uh, that it's, I forget, I think it's N33 or L33, like for, and then it's got all three of our initials, so the three kids, so 33 was, my parents had been married 33 years, <clears throat> and then it said like KDD or something like that, I think that's what it is. Okay, there's some significance to that, what's there then. Yeah, yeah, but we we, we think it's pretty funny that, uh, you know, he, not that we really think he's there, you know, watching, but the symbol, the symbolism of it is, is, is been, is great because, you know, if he, if he was there, he would love it. And, and, uh, it's one of those memories from being a kid where anytime you could hear a plane outside, you know, we just stop what you're doing <laughs> and I stop what you're doing. look at the plane. Right. And my dad would see if it was somebody he knew or he could recognize the tail number. He could recognize the, um, by the, by the tail, what kind of a plane it is. And, you know, he'd say, Oh, that's so-and-so. And and that's a whatever (laughs) type of plane. And we'd be like, okay, that's great. (laughs) But uh, we, we hear planes a lot based on where we lived because we lived so close to the airport, but uh, that was a a constant uh, presence. Because anytime you hear an airplane, you gotta go look at it. Did you go to air shows like is it the Blue Angels? There was a Air Force Blue Angels or something. Did, would you go to those if they came close? Yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. And you know, my dad's friends were all pilots. Uh, well, I mean, not all. Of them. He did have work friends too, but he had a lot of friends who were pilots, and um, they're they're a funny group. <laughs> no, they, so uh, yeah, I can remember one of his friends in particular became a pilot for American Airlines. And there was a time when uh, I took a flight on American and he just happened to be the pilot for that flight. It was such a random uh, occasion. But they, you know, my dad's flight buddies and his, uh, his friends from work too, you know, just had a deep amount of affection for him and uh, had such fond memories telling stories about uh going to watch planes or, or flying with, I know I flew with your dad to whatever for this. And, you know, he was so funny. He bought a hot dog for this girl who you know, dropped her hot dog. And, you know, just some, they have these stories uh, of their memories of doing things with my dad. And uh, it's such a, it's such a reassurance. And it's uh, like I said before, it's really such a joy and a privilege that he left such a positive influence on people. Well, any of these fellow pilots, females, I mean, I mean, he did, he wasn't opposed to females being pilots. No. I was just curious. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't recall any female pilots. Um, Women just didn't do it as much as par- during his time too, I guess. Yeah. And I always, I think in back of my mind, I thought I might do it someday, but <clears throat> I haven't. I'm okay with that. <laughs> I like riding in a plane for sure. Well, do you know how he got interested in being OSU's flying for OSU some? I mean, that would have been after you were probably out of college or at least out of the house. Yes, it was probably around the time I was finishing college um, when he first developed a relationship 
where that was part of uh, some of his flying experiences. And I think it, it, as the way I understand it, it primarily came through a man who is, a, who was, he's passed away now, but a, a big a donor to OSU. His name was Dick Bogert. Um, and Dick and his wife were friends with my parents. And my dad would fly with Dick and for Dick um, on regular occasions, not related to OSU. And Dick had a plane um, and that was not the plane that crashed. It was, uh, but at the time, you know, that, when they first started helping OSU, I think it was primarily the golf team um, that Dick would donate his plane <clears throat> and, and my dad's time <laughs> to, and my dad loved it. I mean, it was so much fun to, uh, you know, participate in that and fly the golf team around. And then that graduated to the basketball team also, and it had a huge influence on why my brother chose to go to OSU. I can't wonder. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> he would he would say that in a heartbeat because when my brother was in high school, uh, he was able to, you know, meet all of these OSU basketball players and uh, you know, be a part of some. I don't think he flew with my dad very often on the plane, but he he was able to be you know either at the airport or be a part of something where he could meet uh, players. And, uh, at, you know, at that point, my dad had developed a friendship with Eddie Sutton as well. And, you know, he's just a, you know, my dad's was just type, that type of guy that everybody loved to be around and felt safe with. And um, so he, you know, I think uh, when it was appropriate, when a donor had a plane that my dad could fly and do it. And my dad was one of the first people they would want to, to do it. Um, so I think that's how it all developed. But my brother would definitely say in a, that that's why he went to OSU because uh, he had you know, made some friendships through my dad's connections. Uh, and also uh, knowing, uh, I know my brother volunteered uh, for some basketball operations also because uh, he loved to play basketball too. And you know, he wasn't you know, good enough to play on the team, but uh, he, he loved being around that world. So, and he was... A senior, junior, when it happened here on camp. Senior. Senior. Well, he was about ready to graduate, and uh, it was uh, it was very very difficult for him to be. And he knew, you know, I only really knew my dad, um, but he knew everybody. Okay. So it was it was even harder. And there's a backstory too that you know there was a co-pilot on the flight. Bjorn, uh, Ballstrom, and um, you know, that King Air didn't didn't require two pilots, uh, but Bjorn often would accompany my dad on flights. Uh, but sometimes my dad would take my brother, and in this case, he had asked David, my brother, to go. And uh, my brother had already had other plans to actually to go on a trip with my sister, so mm-hmm. he declined. Uh, but you know, he did have some guilt about that. That thought maybe you know he was supposed to be there things work out how they're supposed to work out like it you know yeah and, uh, and it was also nice that I mean when he did find out he was with my sister so they had each other but they were in San Francisco you know I was in Washington DC and my brother and sister in San Francisco it was just it's you know just difficult to not be home well, I don't know how well since we're to that point let's just go ahead and Talk about how how you found out this switch. You know, move on up to January twenty seventh. You know, talk oh, sure. a little bit about that time. Sure. So I um, I had uh, it's obviously it was a Saturday night, and uh, my husband at the time and I had had some friends over for dinner, and I remember I'd used like my china, which I don't ever. You know, it was just one of those moments where you're like, I should use my china, and uh, we were washing dishes. They had left, and we were washing dishes in the kitchen. And I think the TV was on. And my mom's best friend Judy called the house, and I answered, and she told me that uh, there was a problem, and that my dad's plane hadn't made it back from Colorado. And I had actually that afternoon had watched the game on TV for a little while. I didn't watch the whole game, but I would frequently, if I knew my dad was there, you know, I'd turn it on and find him in the crowd, you know, and I had done that that afternoon and seen him in his orange shirt, you know, and uh, with a cup of coffee or something, maybe it was a Coke or something, but, uh, and I I found him in the crowd and then uh, 
I, I knew where he'd been. I knew what was up. And she said, we don't know anything yet. Um, we just know that the plane didn't make it back. And uh, so I said, okay, and let me talk to my mom. You know, so I talked to my mom and she was very upset. And I think she felt like she knew. Um, and then it was not long after that, that uh, my mom's friend, Judy called back again. And she said that they've confirmed that there was a crash in Colorado. We don't know anything else at this time, but we do know that there was a plane crash. And it wasn't long after that, that, um, you know, we had turned on ESPN and there was a, you know, the TV news coverage broke and it was the press conference at OSU where they announced the, that the, one of their planes had gone down and the pat who were the people on the plane. And uh, so that was very, uh, you know, just watching that was kind of surreal and hearing my dad's name on ESPN, um, you know, in my kitchen in Washington, D.C., just feeling very helpless. Um, so uh, my the people I worked with at the time and the Doles, they were, we were all watching ESPN together. And uh, you know, I'd called them in the meantime. <laughs> so they, they had turned it on, too. And they're like, we, we saw that, you know, and immediately, you know, somebody bought me a plane ticket and uh, you know, we made arrangements for the dogs to go to the kennel. And I left on the first flight out, you know, the next come to your mother to get to get to your mother yeah, yeah. I had to call I did call my um my brothers I mean my dad's brothers two his two brothers and two sisters so I called the oldest sister first and um you know it was the middle of the night by the time I called her and I did I don't I think I've maybe called her twice and well I see her you know we write letters or I'd see her on Facebook I mean, the fact then there wasn't Facebook but you know what I mean? It wasn't like I picked up the phone and called my aunt. Or the other. So I called her and she, you know, she was very upset, but you know, she called her, um, my mom just, she couldn't do very much at all at first. Yeah. And I, you know, and I really didn't get a chance to talk to my brother and sister either until we all got home. <clears throat> Getting on that plane. Was it difficult? It just was. Yeah, not I was was worried about it crashing or anything like that. Just uh, you know, the reason, I, the reason you were having to get on. Yeah, I'm sure people have to do this all the time. I kept telling myself, I mean, people lose loved ones all the time, and, uh, <laughs> and but you know, I was wearing you know, I I I got up, I took a shower, I tried to like look somewhat presentable, but you know, I'm big sunglasses and not wanting to talk to anybody, but you know, I just kind of curled up in the corner and I, I pulled out a, a legal pad and I started making notes of things I wanted to remember specifically um, to about my dad. And it just, it was very therapeutic just to start writing things down and uh, you know, remember, like I, I wrote down about being a teenage girl and, and taking us on shopping trips and um, or taking me on shopping trips, uh, learning how to drive a car. I mean, we wrote, those were some of the things I talked about, you know, but I would just write down, I remember the, you know, you start thinking about when's the last time I talked to my dad. And uh, I had just talked to him <clears throat> that week, maybe on Thursday, I think it was Thursday, uh, right around this time. It was the, you know, right after George W. Bush had won, uh, the presidential election, and it was, it was almost uh, inauguration. And uh, so the inauguration, actually, the inauguration had just happened. That's what it was. It was, I think it was the weekend prior to the plane crash. And my dad had called because he had a client who, grandchild, something like that, collected uh, beanie babies. And my dad said, I'm, he thinks that there are Republican and Democrat Beanie Babies for sale right now in Washington, D.C., uh, that if you could go buy a set of those, I will pay you back and I'm going to give them to this guy for his grandkid. And I was like, OK, I can do I mean, Sure. I'll go look for them today. You know, I'll go look for those Beanie Babies. And uh that was kind of fun. And I, what I, another thing I remember about that call is that I was on the phone with um, one of the Dole's um, friends and slash uh, somebody who they were working with. And I 
had, when my dad had called, so I had the message come in that my dad was on the phone. Do I want to take it? And I did ask this man who I knew him fairly well, but still it wouldn't be normal necessarily to take the call. But I, I did tell him, I said, can I, would it be okay if I called you right back? Cause it, my dad's calling and I want to see what he needs. And uh, he's like, okay, sure. But I felt, I mean, it's just one of those things where you're like, gosh, I'm so glad I took the call. I mean, what if I had not, and we forgot to connect or something like that, you know, it was, I was really glad I got to talk to him. You can't and even without beanie babies. <laughs> Did you find the beanie babies? Oh yeah, well, I found. I had them ready to go. Yeah. That was his. That was characteristic of him. Then going an extra yard to make someone happy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He thought he could really save the day there for his buddy <laughs> and his grandchild to be able to have these, you know, collectible beanie babies. That were all being sold in Washington D.C. <laughs> well, that, that's, a, that's a sweet story, I think. Yeah, yeah, I thought so too. Well, it's just this, those things that you just think, "Gosh, I'm," you know, it could be so much worse. <laughs> as far as how I remember, uh, you know, the last memories of my dad, because I did, we didn't go home for Christmas that year, uh, which I don't, you know, I regret, but you know, we didn't go home for Christmas and. Um, I so, but I talked to him, you know, I probably talked to him about once a week on the phone like that, something, you know, like a beanie baby, or uh, he wanted to tell me a story about somebody he ran into that I knew from high school, or who knows. I mean, just random things. But he'd come up with a reason to call or I'd call him. And would he fly to DC to, to visit? Only a few times. I'm Only just thinking. It's a little further trip, I guess. Well, not too much further than Kentucky. <laughs> True. True. That's right. Well, just the time of bringing the dogs was one. And uh, yeah, he, I didn't have, I think, you know, to when I was in Texas, there was a lot more reason to be down and you know, have flying a plane down there, or picking up a plane down there or something like that or work. Um, and DC didn't have, I think they, I mean, I know he came, he and my mom came two times maybe, but they, I think they flew commercial. But I came home a lot. I mean, I would come home several times a quarter, <laughs> almost probably almost once a month. Uh, we had a reason to come back. Would you consider yourself daddy's little girl? Oh, absolutely. That was. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was on a Saturday. And then on Wednesday, they, the university had the memorial service in the arena. Do you have anything from that that you want to share? Mm -hmm. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, I remember it very well. Um, that's when President Halligan made the, the, the promise to, to never forget them. I, I remember that. Yes, uh, that was meaningful. It's, uh, yeah, we went to, we went as a family. A lot of our extended family came. Uh, my dad's siblings had driven in from Kentucky also um, with their families. So we had, we had a big group there. Um, it was my mom's brother's birthday, you know, I remember that. And just, we all felt the sadness that this was, you know, he's having to do this on his birthday, but he didn't care, you know, but this is more just us worrying about him. Um, and of course my dad's birthday was January 31st. So, you know, we're all thinking about, he, you know, he was almost 56. So he was 55. <clears throat> and as far as going to the event, um, it was, pretty overwhelming. It was very well attended and it was overwhelming um, on a couple of reasons. <laughs> you know, one, obviously, you know, it's it's like a, a public, um, <clears throat> it's like you can't just hide from the fact that this happened <laughs> anymore. You know, it's there's a lot of people who are acknowledging that this happened and it happened to nine other families too. And I think it was maybe one of the first times we really appreciated and took in the fact that there were nine other families hurting as bad as we were at the moment and, uh, and seeing them hurting too. Um, it, it was pretty you know, overwhelming at the time. It's very emotional and, and feeling, um, you know, it's, it's so thankful. It's continuing to be so thankful that, um, you know, my dad was a great guy and 
you know, we love him so much and, you know, he left such a legacy and then realizing too, you know, that the, the, the rest of the people on the, you know, there were quite a few younger people who really never had a chance to have a, you know, a career or, um, you know, touch other people's lives as, as adults. Um, and so, you know, you just, it was, it was, it was, um, very nice. I remember feeling like in the flat, there were lots of flowers and, um, you know, the things that were said were very nice. Um, we were, you know, and I, we saw quite a few people who had nice things, you know, talked about my dad, uh, privately. And I knew people there. I had some friends who were, uh, still in the Stillwater area and people who'd driven, you know, friends of the, our family who'd come in from Oklahoma city too. So it was nice. You know, I don't think we, we did appreciate the promise at the time uh, we will remember, but I didn't, you know, it's not that I didn't believe it. I just didn't know what that looked like or what that was going to mean. Um, and I would definitely say we feel like uh, they've done, a, they've exceeded any expectations that we have had uh, to achieve that goal and that promise. Um, so with the memorials, they're, they're, stunningly beautiful and a fantastic tribute. Um, and the fact that they've done it in Colorado as well. And the one in Gallagher-Iba is fabulous. And then each year to take the time, I mean, somebody from OSU has taken the time to write a letter to our family to uh, make that promise again. You know, we remember. Well, did you I read somewhere that the family got to pick a song to be played while they were talking about their family member. Do you remember mm. what was chosen for yours? I, I don't I don't remember that detail, but someone had mentioned that. I'll have to go back and listen to the memorial service again. Yeah. So and then they did they assign liaisons. Did you have do you yeah. remember who who was who was signed to you, your group? Yeah. It was um I know his name's Tom and I think he was in charge of ticket sales. Like uh, I'm trying to remember his last, my mom would know his last name and I feel horrible. But I'm not yeah, that's okay. But yes, he was uh, fantastic. And I think he's passed away uh, now and it'll come to me here in a second that he, he was, he and his wife were lovely and very accommodating. You know, they were with us uh, every time. Uh, we were at, had to be in, or not had to be, we're, we're in Stillwater for a purpose related to the, to the crash um, and checking in all, the, you know, on a regular basis. I know they drove to Oklahoma City several times and, uh, to check on my mom. And uh, they were not just there when, you know, when they were supposed to be there, but also there at other times too. And then did you attend the dedication for the memorial there in Colorado. Oh yeah. That was in August, I think, of that year. We were anything there. anything to to share about that day, that particular day? I remember it being um, you know, it was we had had a lot of um media requests, I guess, as the, you know, talking to various media sources. And I think that was one of the times when I was surprised that here it is, you know, six months later, and it still demands uh, the coverage um, that it did. And um, so I was, um, you know, was touched in some ways. I tell people, I, I used to tell people this all the time, and now every now and then it's relevant. But I'd say, you know, um, Having somebody die tragically who you're close to like that is is hard, really, really difficult. Um, but God gives you, you know, it's like the enormity of the difficultness is matched by the outpouring of love and support. Uh, you know, I think sometimes if a parent or a close friend had died, you know, silently almost, or, you know, it's not that people, the closest people in your world know and care but you don't necessarily get the, uh, you know, the person I went to high school with or my boyfriend, my freshman year of college or, you know, writing you and calling you and checking on you because everybody knows that it happened. So I really felt the presence of God um, on a grand scale and uh, things like the 
uh, memorial dedication in Colorado were an illustration of that, just because there were so many people who cared still, you know, and knew that this was happening. And it was very difficult um, for our family. Uh, we love, you just want to wrap your arms around everybody who's in this together and love on them. But, you know, there's also everybody grieves differently and a little bit of checking and not want to, you know, cross any boundaries or things like that. But we, I think universally, um, the families were all feeling a lot of grief for themselves and then grief for the other people's loss too. And um, I know I, uh, <clears throat> I didn't have kids yet at the time. And I was thinking about, you know, the enormity of losing a child. Uh, and I remember at that event, recognizing the parents who were there who lot had lost a child in the in the crash and uh, or even a young adult <laughs> lost their child and um you know just we were i had a huge amount of grief uh, but the um, enormity of the and the magnitude of the grief from a mother or father um we could see it on full display or i could see it on full display and um, I was just very aware of it, and it was um, it was um, you know I was just praying for these people and praying for ourselves too, you know, that we could get through it. And uh, but also feeling thankful. I mean, we looked at the memorial and just I'm absolutely amazed that people took the time to create something so beautiful. And there's so so much that went into it. Uh, the artist, uh, and then you know we had written. I know each family had submitted what we wanted it to say. And that took, a, you know, an effort <laughs> for everybody to come together. And we were happy with what we said. Um, and, you know, just looking at the site, uh, trying to visualize what it looked like at the crash and also not wanting to think about that too. Mm -hmm. You know, things like that. Uh, we, we saw pictures of the crash um, quite a bit. So we, I knew and being there was, um, you know, it was very uh, beautiful uh, for one thing, not just the memorial, but the setting was beautiful. Um, it was a gorgeous day. It was kind of hot, but uh, yeah, we were just, it's a lot of overwhelming feelings, but very thankful uh, and uh, very uh, blessed to, uh, that, that, that the people took the time to make it so special. Was that the first time that you had been there? Oh, yes. Was that was. the first time? Now, after uh, we were in communication with uh, the officials there uh, quite a bit, I know um, one of the things that you know, when they were cleaning uh, the rubble, they had found uh, my dad had a watch that he wore all the time and uh, they, had, they had found the watch and it was pretty mangled, but uh, it had his initials on the back. And uh, one of the city officials there you know, took the time to package it and mail it to my mom. And we still have that. Uh, it's, it's, uh, my mom doesn't like to look at it at all, but um, we, our kids, <laughs> we don't mind looking at it, but that uh, I think it had, it had come to us for just right prior to the, the Colorado dedication. And so we were thinking about the, you know, the mangled watch, um, and thinking that was on my dad, <laughs> you know, it's just like, it's hard to think about all of that. And, um, but, you know, we were just also just felt like that community, you know, if it's going to happen in a community, thankfully it happened in a very loving, kind community like Strasburg, um, where the officials and the people who live there, um, you know, were, did a, did a lot to <laughs> sacrifice and to make sure, um, you know that the, that the space was protected, and uh, and then they I think they donated the space that where the memorial is, which is also really nice. I've taken my I've gone back um, probably seven or eight times. I've go back, you know, to and my I've taken my kids to see it. Uh, both of them have been twice, probably most recently about two years ago. That we we talk about it. My older son has been in Gallagher Iba quite a bit. Mm -hmm various basketball reasons um, and or for football or something. And, you know, we take the time to go um, lay flowers if we're going to be there. 
at the one in Gallagher Iba too. <clears throat> because you know, even just if it's a random day, uh, and it's, it's just such a, a special, special, um, obvious uh, memorial. There, that's really, really nice. Yeah. So in between that dedication, the Colorado dedication and the and the Gallagher Iba one, nine eleven happened. If I've done my work, so that would have. Ha- did that have any? I don't know, additional meaning for you? Absolutely, because I was in D.C. Being in D.C., yes. And I, my office was in uh, Roslyn, which is Arlington, Virginia, just across the river from D.C. Uh, on the uh, and, and right next to the Pentagon. So we um, we had, ev- had to evacuate. And my office, also the office building across the street from my office was the USA Today building. And the, it was, yeah, all I could think about was, well, I got a phone call uh, that morning and it was my husband at the time. And he said, a plane crashed into the World Trade Center. And I was just like, what? Yeah. And just my first thought was thinking about, you know, my dad's plane crash, but I was visualizing a big, you know, big plane. Uh, no, I was visualizing a little plane is what it was. And then uh, realizing it was a big plane was shocking. Uh, but we, um, I didn't think anything about it. But next thing I knew, uh, they were evac- they, the l- alarm went off in our building and we had to evacuate. And so we're all pouring, we had to take the stairs down to the street. As we're all flowing into the street, we can see all the USA Today employees doing the same thing. And they were just grieving and bawling. And, uh, you know, some of them couldn't even walk because they were so upset. And it was about then that their big, uh, graphic display was, um, you know, on the outside, the TV screens on the outside, the show was showing the images. And we just, I mean, everybody's just standing there unsure what to do next. I mean, we couldn't, dr- they closed down all the streets uh, where we were, we couldn't drive. And then we could see the, um, the smoke rising from the Pentagon and the fire jetting. And uh, we, you know, at that time I hadn't really, you know, I didn't really know what had happened, but we were told that, you know, there were, we didn't know if, you know, if this was the beginning of World War Three or we, I mean, we just didn't know what else was going to happen. And so everybody just started walking um, away from the center, you know, of DC. And I probably walked two miles or three miles before we got out of the area that was shut down and um, was able to get, but my mom was petrified because no cell phones worked <laughs> the cell phone. They shut down all the cell phone towers, but I got to Starbucks of all things <laughs> somewhere. You know, too, I was with several people though, too. And we were able to use the landline there to call everybody that we needed to call and say we were safe. And then eventually we were able to get a ride home. But I think that, uh, yeah, one of my biggest memories from that day was feeling like I had just been a part of, a uh, tragic loss of 10 people and the magnitude of that and how um, how horrible and absolutely awful uh, that was for 10 families. And imagining that times, I didn't know at the time, but hundreds of families. And then now we know thousands of families you know, going through that devastating, tragic loss. Um, it was almost just too much to, to think about. I could, I could visualize, uh, I was picturing, you know, these hypothetical homes that were getting this news that we did um, just nine months earlier and uh, feeling just a, a horrible sadness for so many people. Well, what were some things that helped you get through that time period? Probably. I mean, my faith and our family has a strong faith and knowing my dad did too. Um, and what would he want? You know, and thinking about that and trying to, you know, just take the, um, look at everything with thankfulness, you know, recognizing that it, this stinks and it really hurts and I'm sad and all of that. And I'm sad for everybody else, but trying to focus on the things that we're thankful for, that helps a lot. Um, I think that's 
also what my dad would have done. And I would say the support of, like I was saying earlier, just the magnitude of support, um, the people who know, even today, you know, um, you know, they'll say something on the anniversary on the radio or TV and people who wouldn't normally be thinking, oh, my friend's parent died 20 years ago today or 19 years ago today or 18 years ago. You know, they get reminded. And so we get a lot of, uh, I mean, people take the time to say, thinking about you today. Um, you know, we love you. We know today's hard. And, and that's just the type of uh, support that's absolutely wonderful, very uh, means a, a lot to us. And, you know, if you, if it was a, a just, it's, it's the counter thing, you know, because it was so public, I think it, you know, we had to deal with things that wouldn't normally have to deal with, but we also get a, that much more support and love from uh, you know, people who care, including OSU too, like we talked about. It's just a, it's a, you feel like if there probably wouldn't be a better way to handle everything than the way it was handled. I think, and then did they do a scholarship? Does your dad have a scholarship in his name? We do. And part of the legacy. Yes, we did. And I, I believe we, I, there was a fundraising effort to contribute uh, to it and make it bigger. So I knew um, my family contributed more and so did uh, several other of our friends' families. When uh, we did, when we had my dad's service, we did say, you know, in lieu of flowers, please make a contribution to this fund. And we tried to help it. And I, and I know my mom gets letters every year from the, the beneficiaries of the scholarship. Okay. And do you or some, uh, you since you're in, well, you probably do. Do you come up for the annual, whatever they're happen to do, be doing on the annual yeah. annual days of it? I've made the majority of them. Uh, there's probably a one or two in there. I didn't make it, but uh, they do. They typically have it as a uh, con in conjunction with the fast the home that's closest to the date, and uh, they they always set aside a, a section of the student section for the family to sit in, and um, they'll do a moment of silence during the game, or so. And they they have a dinner. In the past, they've had a dinner for the family prior to the basketball game. And that's, you know, it's amazing how um, you know, there's several of the families that we know pretty well now. And it's um, it's actually really nice to see them and, uh, you know, connect with them and hear, you know, what's happened in their life um, for their, you know, for the remaining family members, the parents. the um, And it's usually a very cordial, happy time uh, to, you know, to everybody be there together more positive than negative. Right. And it gets that way over the years. I've always kind of resisted uh, listening to people who say, uh, well, we really hope you have closure um, on this or you know, your time will heal your wounds or something like that. Cause I resisted. I always be like, this is never going to heal. <laughs> this is, there is no closure, you know, and there is truth to that for sure. It's a, uh, I don't, you know, it's, the tears flow easily if I start thinking about it or remembering it at that time. And um, it's always still there, but time does help to uh, see, you know, to remember the positives and to also, you know, just see it from a, a broader perspective. And, um, you know, one of the things for me that I like to think about is, you know, I probably, who knows when I would have started my family and, you know, I've got these two boys that are fantastic. It also prompted our move back to Oklahoma City from Washington. They just that desire to be back in Oklahoma. And I've absolutely loved that that, that transition happened. Uh, and I don't know if that would have happened either. Um, but, you know, just uh, there's things that you know, there's things to be thankful for and uh, things that we, uh, you know, and also just trying to apply the principles that my dad lived by and, and the legacies he left to, uh, to our lives. And then in 2007, they started the run. Yeah. It, have you, have you or anyone in your family participated? Yes. My family has participated several times. Okay. I 
wasn't really able to participate for one reason or another. But my family has, like, for the first several, they would get a, a shirt made okay. in mills or something like that. And uh, as I have all those shirts, but I, I have never been there on the day of the run. Well, I could have done the virtual one this past, <laughs> this <Yeah>. past time. <laughs> I did follow the group on social media, the Remember the 10 run on social and I see all the stuff that happens and it's still just, it's touching that people care so much. And it seems like a great cause that it supports. I do the walk. <laughs> I can't do the run. <laughs> Yeah, I'll have to try to do it this year. I've always thought I would, and then something comes up. I think they have moved it to August, I think, this year. It's usually in April, okay, typically yeah. typically in April, but I think they've moved it to August. Oh, I could be wrong on that, but I think that's what I had heard. I will definitely look it up. <laughs> I would love to participate. Yeah. So when was the last time you were on campus? I'm going to say it was probably for the memorial in 2019, no, in 2020, because it was before, probably was the 2020. Before COVID, because, yeah, yeah, before the lockdown. Yeah, okay. And then this year's the 20th anniversary and they couldn't, couldn't do it because of, yes. of COVID. But my brother, he has season tickets for the football games. And I know this last fall when they opened the, stadium back up he went to several games and uh, he always reports back you know we, we usually take a picture or we you know do something to say we were there um and it will, my mom would probably I don't know for sure if she did it for every time he went but I'm sure at one time uh, in the fall he would have taken flowers for everybody to, or to lay it all the on the memorial yeah it's pretty do you do you like the kneeling cowboy I do yeah, yeah. it's too um but, uh, I just think it's it's truly beautiful, and the location is definitely significant. So you said it was difficult to come up with the inscription. <laughs> A little bit, yeah. Just <laughs> everybody had their own ideas on. Uh, you mean you got a big family? There's a lot to cover there. <laughs> But we just started by writing down a bunch of words, and uh, eventually it came together. Were you, did you have a word limit? Yes. I, I was thinking there might have been a word limit. There was. <laughs> I'm sure otherwise people would have written a lot. But we tried to be simple and also uh, you know, capture as much as we could. And the photograph that they used, is it something that the family provided or did the university uh, or unearth it somewhere? I don't know. No, I think we provided it. You uh, did it. Okay. Weird professional photo that he had taken for his work probably within two years of the crash. And it looks like him. Yeah, it's, it's a nice one, I think. It works. It works. It doesn't. <laughs> well, do you have any, any, any particular memories about Coach Sutton? No, he um, is what, well, I didn't know him very well. Obviously, my, the rest of my family knew him better than I did. Uh, but uh, I was, a, I was, really touched. Uh, he went out of his way to say kind things about my dad right after the crash. And he didn't have to do that. Uh, you know, we were very aware that he could have said anything, <laughs> but he not only, you know, he was very, not defensive isn't the right word, but he said, I would get on a plane with Denver Mills tomorrow. You know, he just, uh, <laughs> it was definitively supportive of uh, believing in my dad as a pilot and, you know, his abilities. And my dad had just maybe six months prior to the crash had received a commendation from the FAA for an emergency landing that he had performed. Uh, they said exceptionally well, you know, he just, he, we, you know, we get defensive sometimes he was a great pilot, you know, and, but the fact that Eddie took the time to state that and, um, you know, unequivocally immediately after the crash, it, it meant the world to us uh, to be that supportive of my dad right away. Okay. And, uh, so other than that, I know my my sister, um, who has the twin two-year-olds, she named one of them Sutton after Eddie. So he's got a legacy there in our family. <laughs> 
Yeah, which is pretty neat. Yeah, yeah that is pretty neat. Yeah, and your son is named Sandy. Well, and then as we switch gears just just a, a little bit on your your mom, I had read somewhere that she would make cookies and leave it for the for the people on the passengers on the plane each time. Yes, I'd forgotten that, but yes, I, I remember people telling me that after the yeah after the crash that she would uh, notoriously send my dad with cookies to have on the. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. And they would have been married thirty three years. Okay, thirty three and a half. Well, yeah. how how is she doing these days? She's doing great. She is. She, she was. Uh, yeah. It, she, you know, she's handled it really, really well. And obviously starting my family, you know, now that she's got grandkids and all that, she, she's very distracted with all of her grandkids. And, uh, but she's doing well. She does a lot to remember my dad too. And um, she's kind of our bit point uh, person for, uh, you know, doing flowers at his gravesite. And um, he, she's done a really good job keeping up with, um, you know, photos and giving us, access to, uh, you know, special things that we may have forgotten about from growing up. And uh, she just recently, uh, well, two years ago, she got married again to a really neat man named Larry, <laughs> Larry Taylor. And so he and she spend a ton of time together doing fun things. And it's neat for her to have that companionship. But she waited a long time uh, mm -hmm. to meet somebody and, and get to get married and it's been neat too because Larry is a his wife died of cancer about four years ago and uh Larry and my mom get along fantastic and he has um children two kids in the area one of them's a pastor and he also happens to be the former uh, mascot for the thunder he was the original rumble that came from Seattle and he's just he's full of personality and life and all that so that's my stepbrother. It's funny to have a stepbrother at uh, 50 years old, but uh, anyway, he's, they've got two kids who are so much fun and they get along great. Anyway, they just, their families have fit in really well with us and um, we're thankful for that. Any of these extended children going to be OSU bound at some point? It would be, I, I, yes, I would say my brother's son, who's 14, is saying he wants to go to OSU. So he's probably the next one in line that uh, has strong OSU uh, blood. And then your two are not, uh, are, are chosen other places. They, they're going, well, my one who's going to college now is going to Cornell College, uh, Denver, my son Denver. He's going to play football for them. And that's what he really was looking for is the opportunity to play football uh, in college. And I, you know, he's, I, he wasn't looked at by D1 schools, so this is what he gets to do, and he's excited about that. It would be hard, hard to see him go. You'll have to give him the same lecture about credit cards. Yes. <laughs> I, I do. Well, we do have those conversations. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's a good legacy to carry on too. I'm trying to, I'm glancing through my questions. I think we've covered everything I headed down. Are, are there anything, uh, anything in particular that just takes you immediately back to your dad, you know, instant reminders? Seeing an airplane in the sky, okay. like driving by Wally Post, uh, for sure. Even just thinking about, you know, him and his role as a CPA, um, you know, when I'm in the Chase building for any reason or driving by the Chase building downtown, definitely. Um, I keep a picture in my room of that picture of us, uh, me as a toddler with him at the airport. Um, and it's super special. Um, probably when I get together with my family, uh, I see a lot of my dad and my brother. I mean, he, he has all of his mannerisms. and Okay, that was that, my question too. Yeah. We well, did, did you get any of them? I think so. I mean, I, I like to think I do, but uh, people tell me I look like my dad uh, a lot, which I love. I've never, it's never bothered me. Yeah, I'd say I do. And, and did, did he have a, a favorite song or do you, this, if you hear a particular song, do you think, uh, you know, that's dad? 
Not so much other than, uh, you know, I do think about him uh, when people talk about Kentucky or uh, especially Eastern Kentucky, not so much like Kentucky Derby doesn't make me think about, necessarily, but uh, you know, the mountains of Eastern Kentucky and, and Northern Tennessee, that area is, that's his, you know, his stomping grounds. And his, he tell he used to tell great stories about, you know, his time with his brothers <laughs> and, you know, they just did a lot of mischief <laughs> and, uh, you know, but he, my, my dad was notoriously the good one, I guess, or he didn't, he got in less trouble than his brothers did, but they would go for days, uh, hiking in the, um, Daniel Boone state park. That's right there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, his mom would just know they'd come back eventually. <laughs> So they would, they would, they were big explorers and uh, my dad loved to fish, you know, and he taught, he taught my sister and I how to fish and that comes from his time, you know, just having a rod in the, in the lake, the area where he was born, uh, you know, he was born in his parents' house, uh, not in a hospital, you know, in uh, Greasy Creek, Kentucky. So they had a lot of creeks there and there's a lot of, when you go back to that part of Kentucky, uh, which I used to do a lot when I was younger, but it was always shocking to me how many of the mailboxes had mills on them. So mills is a really common name there, but I also think, you know, so my dad's parents, my dad's dad was one of 13 kids and my dad's mom was one of 13 kids. Ooh, big family. Lots of, lots of family. And they're all kind of right there in that part of um, the world, except for my dad. <laughs> he, he, uh, you know, he's, he's really the only one of that uh, family that left. Hmm. Well, did, did he have a favorite meal that like he would talk about that his mom would fix for him? You know, favorite childhood memory type thing. I think she made really good pork chops. <laughs> <laughs> That's what uh, he would talk about. Lots of beans and core bread. And uh, they, they really lived on a tight budget. Uh, my dad had his his mother died when uh, I was six or seven, lung cancer, and my dad was crushed. I remember that's the first time I saw my dad. I remember seeing my dad cry, and, and he was very upset uh, about losing his mother. He was very close to his mom, and and he told. I guess my dad was really sick. I don't remember if it was uh, scarlet fever or he had something as a child and missed a bunch of school and was really out of um, pocket for a long time. And he, um, he just nurtured him. You know, I think the story goes, you know, for months on end, she would sleep in it, you know, at the foot of his bed to, you know, take his temperature all night, check on him. And you know, he's a, he was, she was definitely a nurturer and a very loving. And my mom speaks very highly of her too. I think he was his mom. Well, did he have anything like tangible from his childhood that he kept with him? Not that I through, remember through the, through the years. Other than stories. Not a, not a toy airplane. <laughs> no, not that I know of. No. Yeah. No. Just, just really good stories. Yeah. Well, I've covered a lot. Is there anything else you want to, that I haven't known to ask to add? I can't think of anything. They're so kind. The, the university's done a good a good job. Thank you them. say. You say. Yes. Absolutely. So we'll we can close with just how how would you like your dad to be remembered? Hmm. Well, <laughs> I've been so good and I haven't cried. <laughs> no, you've done good. Well, you know, I think that he'd want to be remembered by his um, kindness and uh, always put other people first. Um, he was also very smart and uh, he was smarter than he let on, I think, was part of his charm. But uh, he had good street sense and good common, common sense and street sense. So, yeah, I think he would just want to be remembered for his kindness. Okay. Well, from, whatever you've, from all that you said, I think that a lot of people do remember him for that. Yeah, I think so, too. Okay. Well, if there's nothing else, I'll say thank you for sharing with us today. It's been great. Oh, thank you so much. And also just thank you for taking the time to, to listen. Yeah, it's a, it truly is a privilege to get to do this. And I'm sure the other families feel the same.